so uh, up till now, I think I've used phrases like, you know, I've pointed to a notation like this, and I've said, this is a singleton. I don't think I wrote it down, but I've been saying it out loud, referring to certain things as singletons. So what does it mean to say it's a singleton? Specifically, how do I formally express what it, uh, what this means? A singleton. Like if I told you, a is a singleton. What does that sentence mean? What should that mean to you? It should mean that a can be written as curly braces something, where something can go here. So we can make this a formal definition. So we'll say a is a singleton. So I'm defining the predicate is a singleton if and only if there exists some x such that a is singleton x. So you can think of this existential quantifier sort of saying a can be written as singleton something. Okay, now I want to get into a conversation about the word the. So it can get surprisingly uh, complicated when we try to pin down what it means when we use the on a property. So let's say I say x is the green thing versus saying uh, x is a green thing. When I say x is a green thing, that's just a uh, obnoxious way to say x is green. Right, I'm just saying x has the property of being green. You can think of it as saying x is in, let's call it g, where g is the set of green things. So you can think of it like this, x is green, x is in the set of green things, x is a green thing. So that, no problem there, that is nice and simple. But x is the green thing. What does this mean? What's the, di what's the difference? So when you say x is the green thing, you're saying not only that x is green, but you're saying that it's the only green thing. So it's, it's, there's an implicit word only here, which we're not writing, that always comes with the. So in addition to saying something like x is in g, it's also saying that x is the only thing in G. So let me write it in English. So it says x is green and only x is green. Let me move this out of, out of the way. x is the green thing. x is green and only x is green. Or uh, one word we use is unique. x is Uh, the unique green thing. X is green and it is unique, you could say, with respect to the property. This is a long-winded way of saying it. With respect to the property of being green. So it's green and it is unique in its greenness. Okay, so how would I write that? How would I express that mathematically? Say I want to, uh, I mean, in terms of mathematical logic. So like, if I want to prove something like this, or if I have a statement like this and I want to use it in a proof, then I have to be able to reduce it to mathematical logic terms. Um, I mean, not literally term, but uh, I have to be able to reduce it to uh, the language of mathematical logic. If I cannot, then I cannot apply any of our rules of deduction. So how would you express this? It's misleading the way it looks. On the face of it, it looks like it's an and, right? So it looks like it's saying, first of all, x is green. x is green. And, and then see if you can write down uh, x is unique. That's what it looks like it's saying. But 
you know, actually, I don't know why I said that. It is an and. It's totally an and. Uh, it does say x is green and uh, however is the correct way of saying that x is unique with respect to that property. Yeah, not sure why I was thinking that's misleading. Okay, so how do we say x is unique with respect to the property of being green? We say if you had some other thing that you think is possibly green, so for any y, if y is green, then y is x. That's how you say x is the only green thing. For any given y, if y is green, then y is x. More symbolically, we can write it like that. For all y, if y is green, then y is x. So this is a way of thinking about what is being said when someone says the. X is the green thing means uh, not only is X green, but something that has a universal quantifier in it shows up. For all green things, they are simply X. So the contains a universal quantifier in it. Let's write this in kind of a more general way. So if, uh, if you want to say like let's say phi is x is green. Then to say x is the green thing, you would say phi and for all y, if phi holds with x replaced by y, then y is actually just x. So that's the general pattern for, for saying that phi holds for the x that shows up in phi. So here we're assuming phi is x is green. So this is a way of saying that phi holds for the x that shows up in phi, but also the x is unique with respect to phi holding for it. So let's practice a little bit with this idea. How would you say the statement, there is a green thing? You would say there is an x such that x is green. How would you say there is a unique green thing? Um, it's, okay, this is the misleading part. I think this is what I was trying to get at before. How would you say there is a uh, happy green thing? How would you say that? So to say there's a happy green thing, you would say there's an X such that X is green. And x is happy, right? That's what you would do. So you might think that the way to say there's a unique green thing is to say there's x, such that x is green, and x is unique. After all, happy is an adjective, and unique is an adjective. OK, but here the English grammar is misleading. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, the uniqueness is not a property of x, right? It's not that x is unique. It's that x is unique with respect to its greenness. So the uniqueness is not really a property of x. It's a property of the greenness of x. So it's kind of a, a meta property, maybe you could call it. So while, while this is uh, correct, this is super extremely wrong. So we need to uh, find a way to say there is a unique green thing. And it's definitely a good start to say there exists x such that x is green. That at least says there is a green thing. But to say that it's unique with respect to its greenness is you have to use this idea that to say it's the only green thing is to say that there are no others, which is to say that any possible other is just x itself. So, and for all y, y is green implies y is x. So you see, when someone says there is a unique green thing, when someone says there is a unique green thing, the uniqueness is, is captured in this kind of interesting way of saying something with a universal quantifier. A lot like when you say the, 
x is the green thing. There's, it's all like you're saying, there is an x such that x is the green thing. Okay, so why am I talking about this in the video about being a singleton? Well, because being a singleton actually gives you a nice example of a situation where you have a unique uh, a, a thing with a property and where it's unique with respect to having that property. So if A is a singleton, then we expect that A has a unique element. Uh, th hopefully that sounds right. If A is a singleton, then A has a unique element. So let's, let's make this a theorem and let's prove it. Just to get practice with the, the idea of uh, uniqueness statements and, and the idea of being a singleton. What does it mean when we say something has a certain form? Like has the form of a singleton. So proof. It's an if then, so I'll assume the, that A is a singleton. Okay, and then let me create a scratch work area here. So I know, I know A is a singleton. So that means I know, using the definition of is a singleton, so that was definition 24, I know that there exists some something such that A is singleton of that thing. So I know there exists something such that A is singleton that thing. Uh, so I have this existential. So that, that means I can do existential instantiation and I can make use of this. Um, I also, uh, want to prove, want to prove, let's see, what do we want to prove? A has a unique element. So this I need to write carefully. A has a unique element. That means A has an element. So there exists, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll call it Y just to not bias myself and think that it's the same as the X up here, although it might be. So there's a Y such that Y is an A. That's how I would say A has an element. Now, how do I say A has a unique element? Uh, so I would not say and y is unique. Although it's tempting to say that, to say there's something in a which is unique. That doesn't make any sense. The uniqueness is not a property of the y, but it's a property of the membership of y in a. y is unique in its being an element of a. So uh, y is an a, and for all, for all other uh, posers, poser elements who are trying to be elements of a, like Z, they're actually just Y in disguise. So this is a way of saying Y has a unique element. And in fact, that is sufficiently complicated of a statement that I would even put it in the proof. It would be nice to tell the reader uh, what it is we, what is our breakdown of what, what it is we have to prove. So we must prove that, and then let me copy this over. And there it is. So that's, that's what I want to prove. So I'm trying to prove an existential, an existentially quantified statement that there exists a Y such that this is true. So how do I do that? That would be existential generalization. So I'll have to find an example of a Y, which is in A, such that this is true. Okay, so let me just go ahead and make use of what I have. This, existential instantiation. So, using the definition of is a singleton, uh, since A is a singleton, this is just a short way of writing, there exists X such that A is singleton X, we can get, so this is the EI, existential instantiation, an X such that A is singleton X. Okay, now I need to show that, uh, let me focus here, I need to show that there's something which is an element of A. I suspect I have a good think candidate for that, X. I think that X is an element of A. So I think X will fill the role that I've said Y needs to fill here in this, uh, inside this quantifier. So let me just point that out. Since X is X, then by definition of singleton, x is in there. So since this is equal to a, x is in a. Great, so I have found something that is in a, but now we must prove that this is true about that something. So since x is playing the role of y, we must prove, I'll say we will prove, 
that for all z, if z is an a, then z equals x. Note that there are no y's actually in the proof. y remains bound by a quantifier throughout. Okay, so this is a universal. To prove a universal, the technique is universal generalization. So consider any z in A, right? I'm trying to prove that every element of A equals x. So consider any element z of A, and then I will try to show that z equals x. This is how ug works. So consider any z in A. Um, well then, z is in singleton x, because A is singleton x. So, by axiom 5, to be in singleton x is to be x, so z equals x. Oh, I'm already done with the ug. Um, I mean, that's it. That finishes the proof, right? So we needed to prove, we already said we needed to prove this in order to prove that uh, a has a unique element. We found x, you know, maybe instead of ending here, I should point out, uh, since, just to make it totally clear, since x is in A, and this should be a separate paragraph, since the UG is finished, now, since this is true, we have proven And let's label this up here 1, and I can say we have proven 1, so I don't have to rewrite it. So we proved that there's a y that does this stuff by finding an example, namely x. So actually what I was showing you here is uh, one direction of theorem 25, which is really an if and only if. So it says that a set is a singleton if and only if it has a unique element. What I showed you is uh, only the implication from, from left to right, that if something is a singleton, then it has a unique element. Um, but this is, this is a pretty handy theorem, um, and we'll, we'll use it a bunch later on. Uh, so next, I want to define this uh, concept of occupant. So the definition is a little funky. So one thing to first notice is that the definition starts with an assumption. And I think we've never seen that before, where a definition starts with an assumption. It starts with, assume S is a singleton. Then it proceeds to define awk S. Well, uh, when you see this, I mean, it's not banning you from ever using the definition when the assumption does not hold. It's not like you have to check whether or not S is a singleton every time you use this definition. It's not banning you from using the definition. Um, no one can really ban you from using a definition if you want to use it. Uh, but what it does is sort of warns you that, hey, this is only going to operate as you expect if the assumption here holds. If S is not a singleton, then this definition is not going to operate properly. So that's what the assumption is serving to do. So assume S is a singleton because that's probably the situation in which you would use these, this occupant construction. Then awk s is defined like this. And it looks kind of complicated. So it says, let's see if we can break this down. How would we read this statement? So this is the membership condition. For z to be a member of awk s, it has to be the case that every element of s has z in it, has z being in it. OK, so another way to read this z is in every element of s. So this overall then is the set of things that are in every element of s. Okay, that, that's a little bit complicated and um, if you want to think through how to make use of this and how to prove this upcoming theorem, then you can. But what I'm going to recommend is instead forget about the definition. Uh, all we will need this for is theorem 27. 
So this is the thing to know and to remember about the occupant construction. If you want to go through the proof of theorem 27, you can, but this, is, this one is optional. Everything else before has not been optional. You should go through uh, to, to keep up with the, with the ideas and understand how everything links back to previous uh, axioms and definitions. But this one I'm going to keep optional, um, partly because this notation of occupant is made up for the sake of this course. Um, so this is not like a standard notation that you will find elsewhere. And I, I told, I promised you before, I will always tell you when a, a notation is made up for this specific Math 8 course, this is one of them. Um, okay, so this is the thing to remember about, about occupant, is that it's a singleton element extractor. Uh, when you apply this uh, construction to a singleton, awk of a singleton, it extracts the lone element inside. And it's only going to operate properly if you know that what you're applying it to is a singleton. So if you say awk s and you don't know that s is a singleton, well then you have to deal with the full ugliness of what this is and it's probably not going to operate in the expected way. But if you do know that s is a singleton, then s can be written as singleton something for some something, and then awk s will be that something. Um, this is also the first example of many where you see the word essence in the title of a theorem. Um, now this is not some kind of standard convention or anything like that. This is my personal convention in the notes, um, but it might help you to know what I'm using. Whenever I say essence of something, uh, usually it'll appear shortly after you see the definition of the something. So let me show you another example. Uh, over here, definition of ordered pair, then you see essence of pairs, or definition of Cartesian product, and then you see essence of Cartesian product. So whenever you see that, this phrase essence of, that means this is what you really want to use rather than the definition. Probably you really want to use this rather than the definition. It means focus on this. This is why the definition is the way it is. It's to make the essence result work properly. So later you'll see the definition of ordered pair. It's defined in some funky way. It's defined in that funky way in order to make this result, essence of pairs, operate correctly. And when you go and use the definition of ordered pair, when you go and you want to use ordered pairs in a proof, instead of referring back to the definition, you're probably instead going to refer to this essence uh, result. So that's, that's the logic of, or that's the reasoning behind having this uh, title. It's the sort of essence of the, of the thing being defined. OK. Um, and finally, wh why is occupant? Oh, I want to do two more things. So wh why this occupant construction? What is it achieving uh, for us? And also, why, uh, also, let's do an example afterwards. So what is the occupant construction achieving? So let's suppose you knew that there is a unique green thing. So suppose you know that there's a unique green thing. So you know about our universe that uh, there is a green thing and that it is unique, meaning that it's the only green thing. So suppose you have this knowledge. Then how can you uh, refer to it in a proof when you're making an argument? How can you refer to the unique green thing? Well, this is what mathematicians will often write in their proof if they want to refer to it. To refer to it, they'll say, let g denote the unique green thing. And then they will proceed with their argument uh, in their proof, with g being the unique green thing. And this even works as a definition. You can define g to be the unique green thing. If you did not know the uniqueness, if you only knew that there exists a green thing, then you could definitely use existential instantiation to bring a green thing into one particular proof for the sake of proving something else, but it would not give you any mechanism for making a definition, right? You cannot just say, like, definition, you know, standalone definition, let G be a random green thing. You can't do that. Uh, we just have no formal mechanism for let G be a random green thing. You cannot do that. 
but if you know there exists a unique green thing. Yeah, so I hope you see the, the, the logical problem with that. If you say, let G be a random green thing, then uh, we sort of only know about G that it's green. And we don't, how to put this? I guess there's not really necessarily a logical problem with it. There's just no mechanism for it in mathematical logic, in the, the standard form of mathematical logic that, that, that we're going through. So you just can't uh, make a definition like that. Uh, but if there is a unique green thing, then you can define G to be the unique green thing, and you can make that a standalone definition. Okay, so formally, how do we capture this this idea, let G denote the unique green thing? How do we write this symbolically using mathematical logic? I'm not saying you have to always write it symbolically. No, it's in fact better to write it like this. But I'm saying if we can reduce it to something symbolic, then uh, we have reduced it in to something for which we already have tools for deduction so we can make arguments. How do we reduce this to something symbolic? The answer is like this. This is how we're defining G. Let G be the following. The occupant of the set of green things. So that is what you're doing when you say let G be, denote the unique green thing, is you're letting G be the occupant of the set of green things, which will only operate as expected, which will only work properly if you know this is a singleton. You have to know that uh, the set of green things is a singleton. And the way I'm, dis the way I'm describing this is, sorry, uh, I'm saying it this way because to, to say a set is a singleton is to say it has a unique element. That's why I want to establish this idea. So to say a set is a singleton is to say it has a unique element. Um, so to say that the set of green things is a singleton is to say that there is a unique, it has a unique element, meaning there is a unique green thing, right? To be an element of this set is to be green by axiom five. So for this set to have a unique element is to say that there's a unique green thing. So that's what you need to know. You need to know that there's a unique green thing in order to make the definition, let G be the unique green thing. Okay, so this will be the, the value of this occupant idea. We're not necessarily gonna use the symbol occupant. I'll probably gonna write this, but now you know what I mean when I write this. When I say let uh, blah denote the unique blah that blah, blah, blah. I'm really doing something with this kind of construction where I'm saying, ah, we know that the set of things with this property is a singleton set, and so we can use this, you know, we can do, apply this idea of extracting the one thing in that set. Okay, so that's, that's the reason we're introducing it. By the way, uh, it will come up later in definition 50, so it's going to be a, a little while before we actually see it used again, um, where it's used in the definition of function evaluation. So just warning you that it's, it's going to be a little while before it comes up. But again, all you need to remember is that it's, it's extracting something from a singleton. Okay, so here's, uh, here's an example that I want to look at. So what is this set? This is the set of, well, uh, to describe it, I always recommend working from the inside out. When you start symbolically, work from the inside out. So how would you describe this property of x? It says, for all y, y is not an element of x. In other words, nothing is an element of x. Uh, we already know of a nice way of saying that. It's x is empty, right? Nothing is in x, x is empty. This is the property of emptiness. So what we're looking at here is the set of empty things, a set of things that are empty. Uh, what is it? Is this empty? No, uh, this would only be empty if there were in fact no empty things, but there is an empty thing, namely the empty set. So at the very least, our good friend the empty set is living in here because uh, it has the property that it is empty. 
but we have seen that only the empty set is empty. And now, now probably it makes more sense to you why this idea of only the empty set is empty is expressed in this way. Uh, if some other thing like uh, A here is empty, then A is in fact just another name for the empty set. If A is empty, then A was really just the empty set in disguise. So going back here, let's let's point this out. That theorem. What was it? Theorem fourteen. Writing it symbolically, basic, basically it says this: If A has no elements, then A is the empty set. Uh, let me replace the bound variable. I can use whatever I want for this dummy variable. It's a bound variable, right? So let me use Y instead so that it looks more like uh, the statement in here. So again, it's saying if A has no elements, then A is the empty set. Okay, and going back here, theorem 12 says that X has no elements. Uh, X is free here. Or sorry, it says that the empty set has no elements. Uh, and X is free here, so uh, this is like there's an implicit universal. It's saying for all X, X is not in the empty set. And in fact, I can use any dummy variable I want. So theorem 12 says that for all uh, x, x is not in the empty set. And in fact, I can use y here if I want for the dummy variable. So according to theorem 12, this set up here has the empty set as an element. Right, that's what, that's what this is saying. So let's give the set up here a temporary name so that I can refer to it more easily. Let's call it capital E, since it sounds like it's the set of empty sets. So let's call it capital E for empties or something like that. So theorem 12 says this, i.e. it's saying that the empty set, just using axiom five, it's saying the empty set is in E, right? It's one of the empties. And theorem 14, is saying if A is in E, then A is the empty set. Right? And actually, the theorem 14 says this with a free A, right? There's really an implicit universal for all A. If A is empty, then A is the empty set. Anything who is em anyone who is empty is the empty set. So it's really saying for all A, if A is an E, then A is the empty set. So look at what these two theorems say. Uh, the empty set is an element of E, and anything that is an element of E is the empty set. In other words, the empty set has a, uh, in other words, E has a unique element, and that element is the empty set. So uh, taking these two together, that tells you that according to, um, that tells you that there is something which is in capital E, um, and which is the only thing in capital E, right? So this tells you, let me write it on its own. So I've just written uh, these two things together here. Uh, the empty set is in capital E, and it's the only thing in capital E. So you see, it's it's basically this statement here. The empty set, in place of X, the empty set is in capital E, in place of S, and for all, uh, I wrote A instead of Y, but that's a dummy variable, I can write Y. If I just want to make it look more similar, it doesn't really matter. Um, anything in capital E is equal to the empty set. So together these are telling me, since there exists something that satisfies this property, namely the empty set, there exists an x that satisfies this in my situation, namely x equals the empty set works. Uh, so I can conclude E has a unique element, therefore E is a singleton. 
by uh, theorem 25. So then there's such a thing as occupant E. In other words, it makes sense to say, let uh, W be the unique element of E. I'm allowed to do that because E has a unique element. It's, it's a singleton. So there's such a thing as occupant E. Now, now, given our discussion here, what do you think it is? So this will be one of, the, one of your quiz questions. What do you think uh, this would evaluate to if you work out what is the occupant of E? And make sure you use this, make sure you don't use the definition of occupant unless you enjoy pain, um, and instead focus on essence of occupant, which is what the definition is constructed to achieve. So this idea that it will extract from a singleton what is inside it. So you have to think about uh, what is the unique element of E? And when you extract it, then what, what do you get? So see if you can see if you can write something like this. E equals singleton something, where you fill in the something. Then if you can do that and convince yourself that it's true that E is singleton and then the thing that you chose, then working this out should be just a matter of applying this definition. Okay, uh, last comment, and I'm really sorry that this lecture has, has run so long, um, but this is, uh, I think it will save you time in the long run. Uh, what I'm, the document that I'm using here, you may have noticed, is different from the usual notes that I've been, uh, the usual course notes. And what this is, is um, a version of the course notes with only axioms, theorems, and definitions uh, extracted and displayed. So basically anything that showed up in a box in the set theory chapter would uh, would show up in this. And it's only like 14 pages long. And it's the entire course, basically. Uh, probably will not even cover everything in here. Not even close, actually. So the entire course is sort of summarized here. This is, the way I think about this is kind of like when, uh, you know, when you're playing a board game, you get the full manual uh, with all, you know, a full rule book that you have to read through to when you play it the first time to understand how it works. That's like the, the full course notes, is like that full manual. But then you also get some little reference cards that you, know, you can distribute. Every player gets a reference card, and that sort of gives you a nice pictorial or symbolic summary of what's going on. And if you already know the rules, then the reference card is useful. So this is like that. This is like that reference card in a board game. Um, I recommend printing it out, or at least having it somehow on hand, easily accessible, so that you can quickly reference uh, things. And when you're working out a homework exercise, um, or a presentation exercise, or whatever, make sure you're aware of where the exercise appears. Like, uh, does, it, does it appear between theorems like 22 and 23? If so, then in that exercise, you're allowed to use anything tw theorem 22 and above, but not below. Um, oh, and you can find this document posted on Gaucho Space uh, right underneath where the course note, where the course notes are posted. Uh, and by the way, I just realized in the end of this slide that I made a grammar error here. Occupant of E is going to be a term, so it doesn't make sense to say so occupant E and write a period. This is the exact kind of thing I, I scream at people for doing. So occupant T E makes sense is what I was trying to say. I think I just ended that sentence prematurely. Okay, uh, so that's it. I'll see you guys on Friday. I I'm sorry that today's lecture ran so long. I'll try to uh, keep them shorter, um, but I really appreciate your attention. There there's just a lot to go through.